our first panelist is Professor Bernd Schaeffer from Woodrow Wilson International Center of the United States. Uh, he's a professional lecturer at the George Washington University. Uh, Dr. Bernd Schaeffer is Cold War International History Project Senior Research Scholar. Previously, he was a research fellow at the German Historical Institute in Washington, D.C., and the Hannah Arendt Institute um, at the Technical University of Dresden. He also served uh, four years as secretary for the East uh, German Catholic Church Stasi Lustration Commission in Berlin. He's also a former fellow of the German Historical Institute in Washington. And today he will present us a paper uh, about the unified Germany and the uh, communist uh, crimes. So, Professor Schaeffer, the floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Um, since we have 20 minutes each and we are lots of speakers, uh, I think I'm going to start right away and try to stay within uh, the time slot here for 20 minutes. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, Germany and dealing with communist crimes, which obviously is a, uh, a topic for the post-1990 period of united Germany and dealing with communist uh, crimes. Um, the uh, features uh, of the post-1990 United, uh, post United Germany dealing with uh, the communist past has two unique uh, features which allowed for a quite wide-ranging and comprehensive uh, process in this regard. First of all, the complete seizure of almost all the records of the regime, uh, mostly initiated by dissident activists in 1989 and 1990 before German unification, so on the eastern side, uh, of uh, Germany at the time. And then, of course, after 1990, after October 3rd, 1990, uh, the full administrative incorporation, legal incorporation as well, of the former uh, GDR into United Germany, which allowed, of course, for the use of the entire personal and financial resources of United Germany uh, to push this process uh, forward. And this re really essentially determined the scope, the range, and the depth of the process of transitional justice in United Germany. Um, I want to limit myself to, to, a few, uh, to a few issues, talk about some of them more in depth than on others, obviously. But usually you, we um, distinguish four uh, main features of uh, transitional justice coming to terms with communist crimes uh, after the fall of communist regimes uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, first, lustration, uh, second, uh, uh, court procedures, legal procedures, third, property restitution, and fourth, the rehabilitation of victims and the compensation of victims. There's, of course, a huge difference between East Germany and Poland, especially also when it comes to the uh, subject of this conference, which is dealing with the period between 1939 and 1956. Uh, unlike in Poland, the year of 1956 in East Germany, the GDR was anything but a departure from totalitarianism. It was actually the exact opposite, to the contrary. Uh, so except for a very brief period in 1952-53, the period of harshest communist repression in the GDR actually occurred between 1958 and 1963. And most notable during this period was the building of a fence in the wall around West Berlin in 1961, and then the ensuing shoot to kill order and the deadly border regime concerning so-called illegal uh, refugees. And crimes committed in this context of the border regime then should constitute a large part of judicial efforts by post-1990 Germany to come to terms with the communist uh, past. Um, what was then becoming the GDR, uh, East uh, Germany, of course uh, experienced uh, almost an unbroken uh, sequence of dictatorships uh, uh, between 1933 uh, and uh, 1989. Between 1933 and 1945, uh, the uh, Nazi uh, dictatorship and then uh, the communist rule in East Germany between 49 and 89, and in between, between 1945 and 1949, the Soviet military administration uh, of this uh, part of, uh, of, of Germany. And of course, uh, it would go way too far to discuss issues like so-called totalitarianism and both of those dictatorships, 
the Nazi and the communist dictatorship obviously had some structural elements in common, uh, but also in the German case there are huge contrasts. Uh, both of them started and ended very differently. Uh, both of them had very different levels of public support. The Nazi regime had a high level of public support. The East German uh, system did not. Um, and then, of course, Nazi Germany resorted, obviously, to a global war of aggression and genocide of the European uh, Jewry. And we definitely have to say that the, the crimes committed by those two German dictatorships differed vastly in scope and geographical range. If it then comes to East Germany, of course, we also have to address uh, the issue of the Soviet role and uh, involvement in Soviet involvement in crimes or injustice. Um, this is, of course, a subject uh, that after 1990 uh, was a very uh, politically sensitive subject. Um, when Germany united in 1990, there were still 400,000 Soviet troops on East German territory. Uh, in bilateral negotiations, it was finally agreed that for uh, some uh, financial compensation uh, paid by the government of United Germany that the Soviet troops would withdraw completely by 1994, uh, which they then also finally did. But of course, this affected uh, any issues of Soviet involvement uh, in, in crimes and illegal, so-called illegal activities, uh, in particular between 45 and 49. I will come back to this uh, pretty, pretty soon. Um, after the demise of Nazi Germany and the end of the Second World War in Europe, um, just for one instance, uh, the Soviet military authorities interned uh, uh, thousands of people uh, in uh, East Germany, uh, many of them Nazis uh, in low-level functions, but also sweeping up in this process a lot of other people. Uh, they they um, established 10 special internment camps uh, between 1945 and 1950. And in those internment camps, uh, in those uh, years, some of them were using the sites of the former Nazi concentration camps, like in Buchenwald or Sachsenhausen. And in those internment camps, about 35% of the internees actually uh, perished and died during this period, most of them due to malnutrition and other issues. So this uh, um, refers to about 43,000 people actually dying in those uh, camps um, between 1945 and 1950. Um, overall in the GDR, uh, between 1945 and 1989, we have about 250,000 people that were arrested for political reasons. And of those 250,000, about 30,000 were released uh, to the West, to West Germany after some ransom was paid to GDR authorities by the West German government. Then an additional thousands of East Germans were deported to Siberian camps by Soviet authority after 1945 and during the 1950s. Um, for those deportations, uh, United Germany did not ask the Russian Federation uh, to do any uh, redress, uh, but uh, the Russian um, rehabilitation laws, uh, well actually a Soviet rehabilitation law in the Soviet Union during its last month in 1991 still uh, passed its first rehabilitation law for Soviet citizens for political uh, persecution. Uh, those rehabilitation laws also were then applied to foreigners if they went to Soviet uh, and then Russian courts of course and asked for formal rehabilitation of let's say um, certain verdicts by Soviet military tribunals or by Soviet civilian uh, courts, uh, mostly during the period between uh, up to 1956. And uh, yes, there have been some rehabilitations of uh, German citizens, um, and East Germans in particular, uh, who were, for one way or the other, ending up in the Soviet Union uh, between 1945 and 1956 and were sentenced and some of those were re uh, rehabilitated. And if you had this formal rehabilitation uh, from a Soviet court, then you were also entitled to ask for compensation uh, according to the German in, uh, indemnification laws, uh, which uh, gave financial compensation to all political uh, internees. Um, it would go too far to lay out uh, many of those things in, in, uh, in detail, but there's one thing I really would like to stress if it comes to all the details now of uh, uh, post-1990 uh, um, uh, transitional justice in United Germany. Almost all those features applied, I talked about lustration, applying criminal law to perpetrators, uh, the opening of the files, um, seeking, seeking compensation for victims, all those measures were actually started when Germany was not officially united, but in this transition period uh, in 1990, when 
uh, for the first time in March of 1990, there was a free election in East Germany, then a new government came into power, and this new government started a lot of measures uh, in this uh, regard, which were then taken up by United Germany after October 1990. Actually, still the last communist regime uh, by the Communist Party, uh, which uh, it came, came basically in, in power after the opening of the wall and then after December of 89. Uh, also, this government already started with first measures in this regard. So this entire process is not, as it's sometimes described, something like uh, rich West Germany coming over, taking over, and doing everything here and uh, exacting justice. In East Germany, it really started as an East German process, as a lot of East German participation and agency in this entire process uh, throughout, and it started early on, even before a, f a formal um, German unification. And since 1990, all German parliaments and governments have been very clear in, in, expressing, uh, in expressing their support and their need for the reappraisal of communist dictatorship, and there were wide-ranging efforts started and a lot of uh, money and resources um, provided uh, to, to go through all these various uh, steps. What I mentioned before, uh, one of the most important features of the German example is the securing of the files. Uh, East, East Germany was the only uh, post-communist uh, country in Central and Eastern Europe where the, 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 um, the offices and the buildings of the state security service were occupied by uh, civic activists and the, the files, almost 90% of them, actually seized and sealed and came in coming under control and then used for wide-ranging illustration. This was quite a spectacular process starting in December of 89 uh, already. Um, you might know the numbers uh, for Poland. The ones I have seen usually say that Poland had, let's say, the, the SP had about uh, uh, 24,000 um, um, uh, um, uh, official um, agents and having about 90,000 inofficial collaborators on the books uh, uh, for a population uh, which was about double the size of the East German population. Uh, but East Germany, with about half of the size of the population, had about three times as many uh, political uh, police uh, officers and about double the number of, of informers. So the ratio between population and informers and security police of East Germany uh, is a world record. Uh, this even surpasses uh, the Soviet Union, where the KGB was very large, but the Soviet population also was a bit large. So the, 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 the ratio of East Germany really stands out in this regard. Um, I'm going to, to skip the entire issue of uh, the establishing of the state Stasi Records Agency, the so-called BSTU, in 1992, and then uh, the laws actually uh, then enacted how to um, access the records, how victims could access the records, and how the records are going to be used for, for illustrations. Um, I'm going to um, come, come up with some more details when we have a publication on that. Uh, in my remaining time, I just want to come up with a few issues, with a few numbers, uh, which... Um, actually sort of may, might help us to compare to other country examples and also maybe to Poland, of course. Uh, in, want to focus in particularly on uh, injustice before, before the courts. Uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, issue um, because in, in, in this case, uh, United Germany basically had to apply the law of um, co former communist Germany in order to deal with crimes uh, committed uh, in East Germany, you couldn't use West German law for a crime committed during the division of Germany on East German territory, unless, and this was a special case of the uh, uh, killings on, on the, uh, an inter-German border and on the wall, you are using actually the, the example of the Nuremberg trial, you basically used universal human rights law in order to try to uh, convict people for giving the orders uh, for shooting to kill orders uh, at, the, on the wall, at the wall. Um, the political instructions and the military actions pertaining to shoot to kill orders on the wall against East German refugees uh, were sort of the core of uh, the uh, entire legal uh, uh, prosecution uh, of uh, United uh, Germany uh, between 1961 and 1989. Uh, so, so far, uh, the Berlin Wall about um, 100. Uh, 26 confirmed deadly incidents on the wall. Uh, overall, on the entire intra-German border, we still don't have exact numbers, but they are numbering between many hundreds and maybe up to 1,000, but up to 1,000 uh, might be a bit uh, too, too high. There's still some research project going on in order to determine the exact number of that uh, casualties at the wall, uh, people who were shot uh, during uh, attempts to flee East Germany. Um, 
Other issues which were subject to legal prosecution were any arbitrary and uh, clearly political application of a GDR law which resulted in a disproportionate prison sentence in East Germany or in the 50s still in the death sentence. Uh, then denunciations of individuals resulting in their politically motivated arrest or in other forms of retribution or punishment. Then any illegal actions, even according to GDR law, illegal actions like kidnappings of uh, citizens living in West Berlin or West Germany by the Stasi to East Germany. Uh, there were about more than 400 uh, cases of that or attempts of that. Um, then the mistreatment, death and torture of people in GDR prisons. Um, any Sp espionage organized well by East Germany against uh, West Germany, but this is a special uh, topic, and then things like uh, doping of, of athletes and all that was also prosecuted. Um, let me use my final minutes just to give you an impression of the scope of uh, legal ad investigations, uh, which were then started on all these uh, uh, issues um, in the 1990s, uh, with some centralized uh, uh, prosecutorial offices established uh, in, in Berlin, and thus the number of cases which actually made it to court, and then the number of those uh, cases before court that actually resulted in a verdict. Uh, so those numbers are quite, quite staggering. Um, so roughly, there's an overall estimate for legal investigations that about roughly 75,000 cases of injustice during the entire period between 49 and 89 were, um, were um, researched and investigated, and about 100,000 people uh, came under initial suspicion. But only 1,021 cases against altogether 1,037 defendants were actually slated for trial. About 100,000 people actually in the scope of investigation, only 1,737 then actually um, recommended to stand trial. Um, but 14% of these cases were then dismissed by the courts. In the end, there were only charges filed and tried in court for 1,400 people. Only 1.4% of all the people investigated actually ended up in court, 1.4. And of those 1.4 ending up in the courts, about half of them were um, either uh, released or there were no sentences issued. So, yeah, so only about, in the end, only about 7% of the cases uh, you had prison sentences of two or more years uh, that were issued. 54% of the defendants charged were ultimately sentenced and 24% were acquitted and the remaining 22 were released when the proceedings got terminated without any sentences issued. Um, so in the end, um, only a very small number of people actually ended up uh, in uh, prison at all uh, because also many of them who were sentenced were also already pretty old or were declared unfit to stand trial for health reasons and didn't have to serve any prison times. Um, the exact numbers in the breakdown you can also of course read at other uh, um, uh, sites. Um, and with regard to the, to the wall, I already rem uh, referred to that, that with the application of international universal human rights law, um, that it was possible to completely reverse the terms of legality and illegality with regard to use along the intra-German border. Because according to the East German law, it was actually legal to shoot a refugee, but it was illegal to flee. Uh, so these terms basically had to be completely in a legal process to being reversed. And there were many um, uh, court procedures before the German Federal Constitutional Court in order to determine uh, the validity of this, uh, of this approach, which was then finally approved, and it resulted in, the, in prison sentences for some of the leading Politburo members of the uh, ruling Communist Party in East Germany, the SED, including leader Erich Honecker, who also had to serve uh, some months of prison time before he was released due to ill health to uh, his family in Chile, where he died pretty soon uh, thereafter. Um, finally, um, there's of course the entire complex, uh, which is also very complex, very comprehensive in Germany, with regard to rehabilitation uh, and compensation of victims. Uh, there have been many laws enacted from 1992 and 94 and the following, uh, Im improving all kinds of measures of, uh, of um, compensation for people who were either uh, in, in prison uh, during uh, GDR times or um, for, for people who were actually uh, sentenced. 
uh, on Soviet territory after 1945 for political reasons, for people who were uh, denied access to a certain education, to certain professions uh, in East Germany, so there was some discrimination for, for political reasons, and uh, overall the compensation amount, the exact numbers you can read there so far, exceed far an overall amount of one billion US dollars uh, so far uh, to a pretty large number uh, of, of, of people. Last uh, thing, uh, with regard to the Soviet Union, since we're talking about that, uh, there's the, the entire period where the Soviet military administration was in charge in East Germany between 1945 and 1949 was exempted uh, from uh, the case of restitution. Uh, in order to save money, uh, the West German government and the West German parliament decided not uh, to give financial compensation for loss of property uh, during communist times in East Germany, but basically uh, started offering uh, legal uh, procedures in order to reclaim property. So basically, if you had some, some, some legitimate property in East Germany that was taken away from you for political reasons, uh, you could apply for the return of the property. Uh, and you might got it or you might not get it, but you could not apply for financial compensation. And from this entire complex, uh, the period of uh, the Soviet military rule between 45 and 49, when actually many expropriations happened, based actually on decisions made uh, by, by the Soviet military administration, uh, all those uh, properties were not returned. Uh, and then this uh, had a financial reason, but of course also a political expedient reason if the federal uh, the German government would have actually started to come up with that and uh, basically offering a return of property for Soviet military uh, expropriations. This would have really caused a huge political problem uh, with the uh, Soviet Union and then the Russian Federation uh, at the time. And uh, this was something which was challenged in court by, by many people in, uh, in, in West Germany, but it survived various court challenges, usually barely. And finally, also the European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg in 2005 upheld actually German court decisions validating a law which did not offer compensation for any lost property uh, during the period of Soviet uh, military administration. And maybe I end on this note in order to stay within my time within my time uh, limit. Um, yeah, I think I, I cut on, on other parts uh, already, so I, I'm just leaving it. Thank you very much, Professor Brent Schaeffer. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ihar Melnikau from Belarus. Uh, well, he uh, has some problems now with troubles in uh, Belarus. No, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, glad that he, um, he just decided to, uh, to come uh, for our conference. Uh, Dr. Ihar Melnikau is an historian, editor of the uh, web uh, internet web portal www.eastpravda.ru. He graduated from Belarusian State Pedagogical uh, University, University of Minsk, Minsk and Warsaw University. Uh, it's the center of the East European studies. He's an author of more than 100 scientific articles, both in Belarus and abroad. His main fields of interest uh, consist of uh, Second World War, Sovietization of the Western Belarus in the years 39-41, Western Belarus during the interwar period, Belarusian cutting list, uh, things uh, like, like that. And będzie pan mówił po polsku czy po angielsku? E, no mogę zacząć od uh, polskiego, ale refer to tak będę miał po angielsku, więc. Okay, so uh, as you wish. Yep. Uh, uh, but but, but your, it just just your title. I will just read your title yep. of your uh, paper. It's entitled Contemporary Official Belarusian Historiography Towards the history of unification of Western Belarus and with Soviet Union in September 39. Proszę uh, bardzo. Thank you very much. Uh, I will present my report now in English, uh, but uh, as you understand, I speak also Polish. So questions mogą być po polsku. No a dalej po prostu zobaczymy, co tam jak. I ja, pan przewodniczący powiedział o problemach, the problem is uh, this uh, uh, exhibition, uh, my exhibition, Western Belarusian Atlantida, which, uh, which was opened on 20th of September uh, 2014, and which was closed um, uh, in three days. 
Um, this uh, exhibition was about um, the participation of uh, Belarusian soldiers of the Polish army in September campaign of 1939, and also about the belief, the la about the history of uh, Western Belarus uh, during the uh, 1920s, 1930s, uh, during middle war time, interwar time. So the history, this, this part of our history is uh, completely unknown by the Belarusian society. Uh, so my report will be theoretical. After that, I will show you some pictures from this exhibition and we'll tell you about this history. As far as you know, Belarusian history is closely linked with the history of uh, neighboring states. This fact left a certain mark uh, information of national consciousness of Belarusian society and the uh, progress of building of Belarusian statehood. Significant period of our history connected with the history of the, sec of the first Rzecz uh, Pospolita, which despite uh, the opinions of some Russian and Polish researchers was not a Poland in modern ethnic perception of the word. In fact, it was a multinational state consisting of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, uh, the crown, directly Poland, and the Baltic and Ukrainian lands. Second most important period of uh, relations between Belarus and Poland was during the 1920s, 1930s, when Western Belarusian lands were part of uh, Polish, um, so-called Second Rzecz Pospolita. I, in Polish historiography, these lands called Northwestern Borderlands, or Kresy Północno-Wschodnie, or simply Eastern Borderlands, Kresy Wschodnie, in Soviet and modern Belarusian historiography, these, bo these territory is called Western Belarus, Zachodnia uh, Belarus. In this publication, I would like to characterize not only Belarusian modern historiography, um, but also uh, questions uh, of the history of uh, Western Belarus during interwar time. In Soviet, time, in Soviet times, historians of the BCSR emphasized the exploitative and uh, Polonization, so-called policy of the Polish ruling sectors in the territory of Western borderlands. Especially popular among domestic researchers was a history of uh, liberation campaign of uh, the Red Army in the Western Belarus on the 17th of September 1939. Much attention was paid to the ideological justification of this event. After Belarus gained independence in 1991, Belarusian historians tried to study history from the national positions. From the oblivion where I returned many historical subjects related to the history of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, First Rzecz Pospolita, or First Republic, Belarusian Popular Republic, and other aspects. However, in the mid-1990s, uh, uh, um, for obvious reasons, as far as you know, situation changes and Belarusian historical science uh, was again in the grip of ideology, Soviet ideology. Uh, this, yep <laughs> this fact has had its impact on the study of the history of Western Belarus in this interwar period. If you talk about the study of uh, social and economic history of the uh, region during interwar period, um, modern Belarusian researchers pay big attention to the local history of the different cities of Western Belarus. Historians are gradually moving uh, away from monopoly of the class methodology, using new approaches in studying of economic history and introducing new, previous unavailable archival sources. History of uh, social economical development of the Western Belarus cities and towns explore uh, such uh, researchers as Zdanovich, Tokt uh, from Grodno, Vashkevich, Lutsik, Ivanov, e and others. Um, for example, um, some modern uh, Belarusian scholars wrote that Polish authorities on the territories of the Eastern Borderlands tried to create an effective industrial and agricultural infrastructure. Information on the agrarian history of, of Western Belarus can also be found in the works of um, Adamushka. Uh, this scholar analyzes history of the repression against the rural population that took place in the lands of Western Belarus uh, after the annexion of this territory by the Soviet Union. Uh, this work is also interesting because uh, here we can find interesting facts about economic life in Western Belarus. I would like to speak some words about my personal works. Um, so Igor Melnikov dedicates some of uh, his publications to the history of the Polish banking system and the territory of the Western Belarus in the Middle War period. 
This COBA analyzes uh, activities of major financial institutions that operate on this territory in 1921 and 1939. Besides, Belarusian historians paid a lot of attention to the analysis of the role of the military Asadnictwa, economic policy of the Polish government, and situation with a uh, handicraft. Um, separate research unit consists of the works devoted to the development of education uh, on the territory of Western Belarus. It's what to mention uh, the work of uh, historian from Brest, Dabrinin. In his monography, uh, we can find information about the history of uh, school, uh, uh, school uh, um, secondary school uh, on the territory of the Second Rzeczpospolita and uh, on the territory of Western Belarus. So uh, we can find some information about um, the educational reform uh, of Minister Janusz Jędrzejewicz. The third group of works of the Belarusian historians devoted to the history of the liberation of uh, Western Belarus in September 1939 and uh, annexation of this territory by USSR. In the early 1990s, uh, Mikolai Ivanov, who is now living in uh, Poland, uh, wrote an article about the arrests of Belarusian activists uh, living in Vilnius or in Vilno, about the resistance of uh, Belarusians to the new Soviet uh, activities. And um, Belarusian scholar in particular argued that uh, September 1939 became a great national tragedy, not only for Polish, but uh, Belarusian people lived in the Western Belarus. Annexation of this uh, territory by the Soviet Union meant uh, for Belarusians a simple replacement of one occupation by another. And the um, main aim of the Soviet regimes was to complete the nationalization of Belarusians and make them part of the new historical unity, Soviet people. In turn, another Belarusian historian, Hatskevich, studied the problem of uh, Soviet repression in 1939-1941. He had published a number of documents from the archives of the NKVD related to the organization of deportations and mass arrests of the population of Western Belarus. To the tragic fate of so-called Asadniki and their families devoted his paper Paolo. Articles of Ikan Melnikov disclosed history of Stalin's repressions, uh, repressive policy uh, against Polish citizens in the western regions of uh, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic in 1939-1941. However, it should be emphasized that since 1994, study of uh, events of 1939 is strongly influenced by Belarusian state ideology. As wrote Belarusian researcher Alice Melenchuk, in recent years, scientific papers of many Belarusian historians who deal with the problems of the 20th century give the impression that their uh, authors make attempts to return to the Soviet Union. For example, Kokel and Yarmusik, in their work, paid great attention to the analysis of transformation in social, economical, and cultural areas of Western Belarusian regions after the annexation of Western Belarus by the USSR. Uh, USSR. They uh, believed that the deportation of the local population were just an answer to the resistance of the Polish underground army, or home army, Armia Krajowa, against the Soviet authorities. In the textbook of for the students, which prepared in 1998 by Novik and Marx, so I remember this textbook because I was a student in that time, again repeated all Soviet interpretations of the history of annexation of the Western Belarus by USSR. In September 1999, Belarus celebrated the 17th anniversary of, uh, the 60th anniversary of reunification of the Western Belarusian territories uh, with BSSR. To this date, uh, by the publishing house Belarusian Encyclopedia, was published a book Forever Together on the 16th anniversary of the reunification of Western Belarus with the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. It also mainly repeated old ideas of Soviet ideology uh, in relation to these events. Also that, that books devoted considerable attention to the history of KPZB, Communist Party of the Western Belarus, 
uh, a social, uh, a special place in it uh, held analysis of events associated with the conclusion of the Soviet German Treaty in 1939 and uh, Sovietization of uh, these territories. The leitmotif of this uh, publication voiced Ladisev, uh, main uh, well known uh, Belarusian historian. Uh, he wrote, Despite some negative moments, the reunion of Western Belarus with uh, Belarusian Soviet Socialistic Republic uh, was, a great importance, was of a great importance for the Belarusian people. This process carried out a radical social economic transformation in the uh, interests of the majority of the population of these territories. The situation uh, with the point of view of the Belarusian historians studying the, these events, unfortunately has not been changed in 10 years, when in uh, 2009, Belarus celebrated the 17th anniversary of reunification of um, Western Belarus with the Belarusian Soviet Republic. Especially for this date, Belarusian archi archivists prepared and published a two-volume collection of documents and materials entitled Ty Zachodni i Zachodni Nasze Belarusi. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, the September of 1939 and uh, 1955. This book includes uh, uh, 120 documents from National Archive of the Republic of Belarus. Here we can find a lot of different documents uh, of NKVD, of uh, the government of Belarusian Soviet Republic, uh, um, a lot of uh, well-known documents and a lot of new documents. But of course, uh, um, these documents uh, just prepared just to show um, that the uh, unification of Western Belarus was uh, uh, one of the main um, uh, events in our Belarusian history. Until today, uh, Belarusian historiography has not been studied the history of participation of Belarusian, uh, Belarusians as the soldiers of the Polish army uh, in September campaign 1939 and military aspects of the annexation of the Western Belarus by the uh, Soviet Union. In 2006, in St. Petersburg, was issued monography of uh, Yuri Grybowski, Belarusians in Poland Regular Military Formations, 1918-1945, in which uh, author wrote about main aspects of above-mentioned topic. In 2006, in Poland, this book was republished. Also, um, a lot of articles about this um, uh, problem um, was, was written by the also this report and in 2009 in the Belarusian journal Archie uh, was published an article of uh, Mr. Lutik, Belarusian Front, Military uh, Operation of the Red Army in September 1939, dedicated to the analysis of the military aspects of the liberation campaign of the Red Army in Western Belarus. Unfortunately, most of the current official Belarusian historians continue to use uh, the Soviet ideological cliches which, uh, while studying the history of the Western Belarus in the interwar period, in general and annexation of Western Belarus territories by the Soviet Union in particular. The best example of that is a collection of documents of Poland-Belarus, uh, which was published in 2012 under the auspices of uh, Institute of History uh, of the National Academy of the Republic of Belarus. Uh, also, so this book presents Grand Duchy of Lithuania as a kind of puppet in the hands of the Poles. In terms of annexation of Belarusian lands by the Russian Empire, according to the uh, compliance of this book, uh, allegedly stopped the um, imp uh, the imp uh, impact of um, Catholicism and Polonization of Belarusian population. However, the authors of this publication forgot about the Russification which came to, Belarus, to Belarus uh, after the partition of the first uh, Rzecz Pospolita. Such views are characteristic uh, to the modern Bel Russian historiography uh, that once again seeks motives to justify Russia's right to the western borderlands. Authors of that book uh, wrote that reunion of Belarusian lands on September 1939 allowed to delay the beginning of German aggression against USSR and became one of the most important factors in the defeat of Germany and uh, her allies. Uh, 
Uh, it's, uh, I have to say now uh, that uh, several days ago, on September, uh, on the 17th of September uh, 2014, on this year, um, uh, Institute of hi the History Institute of uh, the Belarusian Academy of Science issued two volumes uh, of the work uh, which called Ryshsky uh, Mir, uh, uh, Peace Treaty in Riga in the fate of uh, Belarusian society and the fate of Belarusian population. Uh, this uh, book, the new book, uh, new fundamental book, uh, repeats uh, the main ideas which I have. Uh, which I have said uh, now. Um, the whole, um, the main whole cl uh, Soviet cliches uh, repeated by the authors of uh, modern Belarusian book, unfortunately. Um, as rightly pointed Belarusian historian Alex Smolenchuk, current situation in Belarusian historiography on the issue of 1939 can be described as very complex. There is a definite return uh, of the historian's mostly old guard to the Soviet position. A notable example uh, in the is the essay of the doctor of historical science, Zielinski, about the Belarusian-Polish relations in the 1920-1940, which was published in the main uh, Belarusian newspaper Belarus Сегодня, or Sovietская Belarusia. Uh, this regard to public uh, figures of Belarusian national liberation movement in the Western Belarus, Polish authorities organized mass uh, punitive expedi expedition called panification. A pacification, wrote the scholar. In fact, uh, the Polish authorities were likely to use force against a Bolshevik underground, which operated on the territory of Western Belarus provinces uh, of the interwar Poland. In 1939, there was a reunion of the Belarusian people in a single state, which was uh, a restoration of historical justice. Um, however, in the modern Belarusian historiography observed, uh, observed positive trends. Important role in the study plays the Belarusian archive of, uh, orals, uh, hi of oral history. On the web portal of uh, this organization, one can find a special section which uh, placed memorials of witnesses of the events of 1939. Now, oral history is one of the most important trends in the development of modern historical science. Thus, modern Belarusian historiography of uh, the history of the Western Belarus during the interwar period in common and unification of the Western Belarus uh, with the Soviet Union in September 1939 in particular is heavily influenced by the old dogmatic postulates of the Soviet era. At the same time, a young generation of uh, Belarusian researchers try to conduct deep study of various aspects of the history of Western Belar Belarusian territories in 1920-1930s. However, despite of a number of the above-mentioned negative trends, study of, this history, uh, of the history of Western Belarus in this interval period continues. Thank you very much. Um, and dear colleagues, um, uh, Szanowni koledzy, ter, teraz ja pokażę zdjęcia z tej wystawy, a, która była zam, została zamknięta. Wystawa została a, przygotowana z mojej własnej kolekcji. Wszystkie przedmioty znajdują się. Można włączyć po prostu ten, ten, ten folder. Po rosyjsku jest tak. A można pierwszy od razu. A, I to wszystko jest z terenów zachodniej Białorusi. A, zna Znalezione. Te, te, te przedmioty, te, te portrety e, właśnie w przywódców e, międzywojennej Polski, które wisieli w szkole e, pod Naroczą, teraz jest pod Mińskiem, a po prostu leżali 70 lat i czekali na mnie i jak po prostu zgarnęłem, przywiozłem i powiesiłem, to postawiłem, może następny włączyć. I tak to wyglądała ta wystawa, te wszystkie przedmioty były właśnie z tych terenów zachodniej Białorusi, to międzywojenne życie e, pokazywaliśmy i Zdjęcia i co ciekawe było pokazana międzywojenna imigracja zarobkowa z terenów zachodniej Białorusi. Po prostu dla ludzi, dla społeczeństwa białoruskiego ten, ten temat w ogóle nie znany, że Białorusini jeździli do Stanów, do Argentyny, do Lotwy, Estonii i tak dalej pracować tam i zarabiać kasy, później wracali, żeby kupić ziemię. I jak na otwarcie wystawy przyszli ludzie, przy czym starsi ludzie, przy czym weterani, bohaterzy II wojny światowej czy wielkiej wojny ojczyźnianej, to po prostu dziękowali, mówili, że to zupełnie nie znana nasza historia i jest taką ciekawostką, której warto byłoby mówić. Można następną włączyć. 
no to są dolary i pieniążki tych czasów, ale z terenu w zachodniej Białorusi. 34 rok, dolary, człowiek zarobił i przez 70 lat trzymał siebie w portfelu, dopóki ja nie znalazłem i dopóki ja to nie przywiozłem, nie pokazałem to, to właśnie ta zarobkowa migracja, pieniążki i to autentyczne zdjęcie Józefa Biłsudskiego, no prawie nieznane, z oficerami węgierskimi, oryginał. A tam zdjęcia prezydenta Myślickiego, no tutaj słabo widać, ale wszystko to można oczywiście zobaczyć, w Puszczy Bielowieskiej, gdzieś tam wszystkie autentyczne zdjęcia z podbiciami, z tym wszystkim. Ludzie nie wiedzieli, o kim w ogóle idzie rozmowa, jak ja w to pokazałem i mówiłem, przepraszam, Polacy to dobrze wiedzą, Białorusini o tym nic nie wiedzą, więc dlatego to jest stała historia i dlatego to warto pokazywać u nas na Białorusi. Można następne. To jest mobilizacja, zdjęcia z Brześcia, twierdza brzeska, nieznana obrona, 39 roku, wszyscy wiedzymy, wie, wiemy o 41 roku, nikt nie wie o 39 roku i to autentyczne e, dokumenty, zaświadczenia z Molodeczna, z Brześcia, powołanie do wojska, e, dokumenty na Białorusinów wypisane, nazwiska białoruskie, ludzi pochodzenia z terenów zachodniej Białorusi, żadnej, znaczy konotacji oczywiście, bo państwo druga Rzeczypospolita, ale o Białorusini. No tutaj te oryginalne rzeczy, musiałem paleczkę policyjną pokazać, żeby jednak <głos> było pokazane, że jednak władza była tam. Ta Polska, no tutaj maska przeciwgazowa i tak dalej, też oryginalne rzeczy i można następne. No i tutaj granica, tutaj drot, drot metalowy, który znalazłem przy granicy w Kolosowie, autentyczny drot, Polski, który leżał i 70 lat czekał na mnie, tak sobie zwinięty i po prostu autentyczny, oryginalny, a tam jest no, taka rzecz, to oznaczenie ze słupu pogranicznego radzieckiego, gdzie jest napisane SSR, BSSR. Był pod Zasławiem tam, gdzie ja mieszkam i tak sobie przy słupie po prostu też tam był, później ktoś tam jego do chaty zgarnął i leżał tam przez 70 lat czekał. Właśnie. No i oczywiście granica, pokazane zdjęcia kopistów, zdjęcia um, oryginalne też Białorusinów. Byłem zdziwiony, że bardzo dużo Białorusinów czy, albo ludzi z pochodzenia białoruskiego służyło w kopie. Bo tak istnieje trend taki, że tym, tam tylko wyłącznie Polacy byli, albo ludzie z pochodzenia jakiegoś tam zachodniopolskiego, a tutaj właśnie ludzie, które no, mają, albo urodzili się na terenie zachodniej Białorusi, albo tutaj poszli służyć i mieli no, nagrodzenia od państwa polskiego, co było ciekawe. Można dalej. No i to też oryginalne rzeczy, policyjne jakieś oznaczenia, guziki, książki, policyjne legitymacji, Um, I to też ciekawe, nieśmiertelniki, polówki nieśmiertelników, które, które zostały znalezione na miejsce obrony Kobrynia w 1939 roku. I tam też nieśmiertelniki, wszyscy na prawosławnych, urodzonych w Prożanach, Pińsku, Brześciu, Slonimi i tak dalej, czyli wszystko jest właśnie z tych terenów białoruskich. Można dalej. No i tutaj jest taka ciekawostka, te mundurki bawi się trochę w rekonstrukcję historyczną, wojskowo-historyczną i tutaj w Polsce to widziano, to jest wszystko, a tam na Białorusi, jak to pokazałem, jak to przywiozłem, to była rewelacja, bo u nas otworzyli Muzeum Wielkiej Wojny Ojczyźnianej, a o historii 1939 roku, kilka zdjęć pokazane i nic więcej. Od razu 1939 roku, od razu 1940. Dużo taka Białoruś z obwodem białostockim, z Baranowiczami i tak dalej. A co było w międzyczasie, nikt o tym nie mówi. A to, że 70 tysięcy Białorusinów walczyli właśnie w tych formacjach, o tym nikt nie mówi w ogóle, że byli od pierwszego, od samego początku II wojny światowej w składzie polskiego wojska i to był główny taki leitmotiv, główne motto tego, tej całej wystawy właśnie, że musimy pokazać to męstwo, bohaterstwo Białorusinów, które od pierwszego dnia II wojny światowej walczyli z hitlerowcami, z faszystami, z nazistami, nie, nie, nie wiem jak to, co w ogóle, po prostu żeby do, do społeczeństwa i do władz to w ogóle dopukać się, żeby pokazać to właśnie to że to, ta historia wpisa się, w ogóle jest w trendzie państwowej ideologii, bo na przykład u nas władze lubią pod, powtarzać, że Białorusini od pierwszego dnia II wojny światowej walczyli z nazizmem, no to właśnie to jest. 
potwierdzeniem tego. I tutaj jest mundurek marynarza floty pińskiej z ORP Wilno, tutaj jest mundurek Pichura z 84. Pułku Piechoty z Pińska, tutaj jest mundurek kapitana Wojska Polskiego z 83. Pułku Piechoty, który brał udział w obronie Kobrynia. I to jest właśnie to wszystko przygotowane, można następne włączyć. No właśnie te mundurki i są rzeczy autentyczne, są rzeczy przerobione, ale tego nie było i to zrobione było specjalnie tak, żeby ludzie to zobaczyli i żeby no, przynajmniej młodzież to zobaczyła. Bardziej mogę powiedzieć, ludzie z takich poważnych instytucji zapraszali, znaczy na przykład z Komitetu Granicznego, czyli ludzi, którzy ochraniają granice, chcieli właśnie przywieźć z Akademii Ochrony właśnie tej, tej granicy młodych ludzi, żeby to pouczyć się, zobaczyć tą całą historię i nawet powiedzieli, że zainteresowani doświadczeniem kop tak jak KOP współpracował w międzyczasie wojennym, w czasie wojennym, współpracował, międzywojennym współpracował z ludnością cywilną. Dla białoruskich pograniczników obecnych to jest ciekawostką, to warto byłoby właśnie do tego zwracać się. Można następny. No właśnie ten ORP Wilno, to jest nowe, ale w każdym razie zrobione tak, jak to wyglądało wtedy. No oczywiście Muzeum Wojska Polskiego mogę, możemy to zobaczyć, ale nie wszyscy pojadą do Warszawy, żeby oglądać to Muzeum Wojska Polskiego. Natomiast tutaj w Zasławiu, 20 km od Mińska, można było przyjechać i zobaczyć. No i oczywiście 17 września, ja nie mogłem to obejść w ogóle i pokazałem Białorusia, radna Ukraina, Zlataja, to wyzwolenie, nie, nie narzucałam jakiś haseł, pokazałam tylko wyłącznie historię, taka jaka ona była wtedy i pokazałam oczywiście sylwetkę starszyna RKK, Rabocie Krystianskiej Krasnej Armii, czyli Armii Czerwonej, pokazałam te oznaczenia, podałem tylko wyłącznie zdjęcia, podałem jakieś tam hasła, przemówienia, wszyscy wiemy o na przykład przemówieniu Molotowa z początku Wielkiej Wojny Czyźnianej, a nikt nie pamięta o tym, że też przemawiał 17 września 1939 roku z powodu tego, no i zdjęcie oczywiście zjednoczenia, tutaj jeszcze Polska broni się, a tutaj wchodzi nagle czerwony armista i po prostu próbuje to przełączyć. Może następny. Tak. No i oczywiście tutaj pieniążki. Ja nie będę dalej mówił, nie będę dalej, przepraszam, ja tutaj przeciągam czas, pieniążki, zdjęcia i tak dalej. Ja zapraszam wszystkich 6 października w poniedziałek. W, na wiejską tutaj jest dom białoruski, tam będzie znacznie więcej zdjęć i pokazywania tego z tej wystawy, to co było i ta cała informacja będzie przedstawiona, tutaj zrobię sobie taką reklamę troszeczkę, a 8 października w środę zapraszam do Muzeum Niepodległości Warszawy o 18.30, będzie pokazywany film dokumentalny Twierdza Brzeska Nieznana Obrona, który właśnie ja jestem autorem scenariuszu, który zrobiliśmy dla telewizji państwowej i tam właśnie też omawiane te rzeczy, więc takie dwie imprezki, 18.30 na Wiejski, 6 października właśnie będzie prezentacja tej całej wystawy i 8 października no, twierdza Brzeska. Teraz niestety wystawa jest zamknięta, ale szukamy możliwości tego odtwarzenia i pokazania właśnie tego na terenie Białorusi, bo Polacy zapraszają oczywiście, ale tutaj, znaczy je, oczywiście pokażemy to w Polsce, ale mm, chciałbym bardzo, żeby to zobaczyli Białorusini, obecnie Białorusini właśnie. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much for the presentation as well as for this testimony. Um, our next uh, speaker uh, uh, comes from Hungary. It's uh, uh, Dr. Cilla Kis from the Univers University of Western Hun Hungary. Uh, no, okay, I will just uh, read what you have sent about your CV, so we'll see. <laughs> Uh, so Cilla Kis uh, holds a PhD in a political science from McGill, McGill University and MA in history from the Central European University. She was a Bosch Junior Visiting Fellow uh, at the Institute uh, für die Wissenschaften for Menschen in Vienna, worked as an associate professor in the Institute of Social and European Studies at the University of Western Hungary, and from January 2014 she's a teaching fellow at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Her research interest is 20th century European politics and history, transnational justice, the memory of politics, and individu individual uh, accounts of European history, including memoirs and life writing. 
she, she published uh, several articles in uh, journals like East European Politics and Societies, Europe Asia Studies, the Bulletin of Spanish Studies in various Hungarian journals. As well as uh, she has contributed a number of entries in uh, the Encyclopedia of Transnational Justice. And today uh, she will present uh, a paper entitled Reckoning with Stalinism Politics, History, and Memory in Hungary. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, pa the paper are going to focus on two major aspects of uh, recalling the Stalinism and how it works. And uh, one is going to be the actual legislation which was passed in order to deal with Stalinist crimes. And the second aspect will be the politics of memory, the symbolic politics, which I think is more important, which stems from this kind of legislation and other uh, political activities. And I will focus on two main periods, the immediate post-Stalinist period first, and then the post-transition period following 1989. Now, as you might know, in Hungary, Stalinism lasted between 1948-49, um, following a short, more or less democratic coalition period after World War II, and ended with the death of, of the dictator, Joseph Stalin, after which um, some slow, cautious destalinization started under the prime ministry of Imre Nagy. The Stalinist period is associated with the leadership, the dictatorship of Matyas Rákosi, and according to estimates, there were some 3,000 people purportedly killed by the authorities, and three times as many who died, so-called indirect victims who died because of lack of care, whose death could have been avoided. Now, the, uh, after 53, uh, the totalitari totalitarianism eased up in Hungary, political prisoners, deportees were released and some cautious rehabilitation started until 1956, the major, the, the reburial, the rehabilitation and reburial funeral of the major short trial victim, the former communist minister of interior, Laszlo Reich, took place. And that's important because it shows that the immediate uh, post-Stalinist period focused on the plight of communist victims when it came to rehabilitation and destalinization. There were also some court procedures which started during this period uh, against the fo members of the former Rakoshi clique, but they only, s only finished, concluded in 1957, because, as you might know, the 1956 uprising happened, and after that, of course, there was much more caution, because on the, one, on the one hand, it showed that maybe too much talk about Stalinist mi so-called mistakes too much talk about crimes might lead to unintended consequences. And at the same time, after the 1956 um, uprising, it was more important for the incoming new communist elite to deal with the um, outcome of the uprising and to deal with those people they wanted to put away as a punishment. So, in fact, of course, the Stalinist um, era crimes did not repeat, the overthrown um, statue of Stalin was not, was not replaced, and in fact, the Stalinist crimes were enumerated among the so-called um, reasons, causes which led to the uprising, but there was not much else said about it until 1962, when inspired by Khrushchev's destalinization, a committee was formed in Hungary to decide to deal with the Stalinist crimes, and basically this committee led by Biscu, Bela Biscu, Minister of Interior at the time, concluded that the Rakoshi clique was responsible for all kinds of Stalinist um, crimes, so they were expelled from the party, Rakoshi stayed in the Soviet Union in exile, and that was pretty much said about this issue, because of course the leadership of Janusz Kadar, on the one hand wanted to placate both the revisionists and the hardliners, or, so to speak, wanted to fight against both of them. 
So basically, any kind of serious reckoning with Stalinist crimes could only start after the uh, transition in 1989, 1990, and at the same time, um, this kind of reckoning always included the 1956, post-1956 uh, repressions as well. Transitional justice um, has different various forms, and one of them is, of course, rehabilitation. And rehabilitation was what started the transition itself, because in 1989, the big uh, state-sanctioned, still communist leadership was in place, state-sanctioned reburial of Imre Noj, who was prime minister during 56 and executed in 1958. So his and uh, his fellow martyrs reburial took place. So as you can see, Hungarians like funerals. And after the um, transition, the first government in, during the 1990s passed a number of laws in order to administer rehabilitation as well as compensation for victims of the communist regime. Now, the first uh, important um, compensation law for those who suffered injustice, including loss of life, um, imprisonment, so on and so forth, um, was uh, covering the period between 1939 and 1990, which is very interesting because, as you can see, it included the war period and the whole communist period, not making any distinction between post-immediate post-war democratic period, Stalinism, or post-Stalinism. So it just had a blanket inclusion of everything since the beginning of World War I, World War II. Which is an interesting thing you can consider that on the one hand, it does not, it, it, it tries to equate, so to speak, Nazism and communism, which is an important symbol, I think, in Hungarian sim politi symbolic politics. And at the same time, it also doesn't make any distinction in within the communist period, treats it as one blanket totalitarian period. And this is something which will come back in the symbolic politics when we discuss the House of Terror Museum, the same kind of approach can be discovered. At the same time, there were some compensation laws about loss of property, including churches, which were the only actors who received actual property back. The rest of the population only received certain vouchers they could use to buy their apartments or buy pieces of land and so on. However, the most ambitious transitional justice effort was a bill, so-called Bill of Justice, submitted in 19, uh, 1991, which falls into the, into the category of ex post facto criminal prosecution. And the idea was that between the period of 1944 and 1990, people who committed crimes but were not prosecuted for political reasons should now be prosecuted, which meant that the statute of limitation, which lapses in Hungary or lapsed in Hungary after 30 years, should be lifted. The authors of the bill argued that we should regard the statute of limitations as told during that period because Hungary lost its sovereignty since the entrance of the Soviet army in Hungarian territory. Note that this bill only dealt with Hungary under Soviet occupation and forgot about the, uh, po the World War II era uh, as opposed to the, to the rehabilitation compensation bill. Now, of course, there, were, there was a very fierce, big debate about this, this idea. 
and it included everything transitional justice can include. First of all, opponents of the bill argued that instead of recrimination and this kind of trials, the country should have a forward-looking reconciliation, building the future approach. Second, people argued that the elapsed time was too long, therefore there is no point in bringing very old people to court, there is very little chance to get good evidence against them, and in the end, it's not going to serve any kind of deterrent purpose, which uh, we would think court trials should serve, because uh, these people are very old, and anyway, we hope that these things are not going to be repeated. And the third argument was the rule of law argument, which claimed that it's impossible, it's forbidden to pass retroactive criminal legislation if something was not a crime when it was committed or falls under the statute of limitation, it's impossible to change it retrospectively. And in fact, this was the main argument which sank this law because the President of the Republic sent it to the Constitutional Court and the Court threw it out, making the argument that the transition took place on the basis of legal continuity, so the new government, the new system has to respect the previous law and you cannot just go against it. And in that respect, uh, this law disappeared from the agenda for a while. There was a new attempt to salvage part of it, and that was a law aimed at the punishment of reprisals following 1956, as well as the punishment of acts committed during the uprising, and it was done based on international law, arguing that it was an issue of war crimes, shooting at unarmed uh, protesters during 1956 was a war crime, and therefore the statute of limitation should not apply. This passed constitutional scrutiny, so it was actually uh, enacted as a law. However, in fact, it had very little effect. There were only a handful of cases tried and maybe three or four actual convictions made against those people, which interestingly included the then leader of the Hungarian Socialist Party, and many argued that this law was actually a aimed against him. At the same time, this was very interesting, I think, in terms of uh, symbolic politics, because it already said something about the 1956 revolution. On the one hand, conceptualizing it as a war between Hungary and the Soviet Union, and emphasizing its uh, fight for national liberation, national independence, rather than an uprising against the government, a fight for democratic socialism, or potentially even a civil war or a, an opening of a civil war between Hungarians. However, as you can see, the uh, efforts to bring Stalinist perpetrators and those who committed crimes to trial and to put them to prison was not very successful, but Hungary was much more successful in terms of symbolic politics. And to that I would like to turn now. It has to be mentioned that these kind of laws, this kind of legislation against uh, Stalinist or communist crime, so to speak, were usually passed during right-wing governments. Now, on the one hand, this is not surprising because after the first elections, there was a right-wing government in power, so compensation, rehabilitation, even this Bill of Justice had to be passed by a right-wing dominated parliament. But even then, after that, we can see that this issue has always been taken up by right-wing governments 
which is understandable. On the one hand, the post-communist socialist party whose relationship to the Qadar regime is very muddy, they were not very eager to deal with these issues, and the liberals, which were usually their coalition partners, were always more interested in the secret service files and the lustration issues. However, the right-wing governments of Viktor Orban, first between 1998 and 2002, and second since 1910, were much more active in terms of this symbolic politics. First of all, in 2000, the parliament dominated by them designated February 25th as the, as the day of communist victims, or victims of communism, sorry, victims of communism, um, which was the anniversary of, a, of the arrest of a, a non-communist MP in Hungary in 1947. And two, two years later, on the eve of this very day, to kick off the new election campaign, they inaugurated the so-called very famous House of Terror Museum in Hungary. Now, you might know this place. It's a very famous, uh, famous location where communist crimes are supposed to be commemorated. But at the same time, it's also one of the uh, most controversial projects in Hungarian memory politics. First of all, because of the history of the building where the, where the museum is placed, fascist and or Nazi and communist crimes are both supposed to be commemorated. However, the Hungarian Aero Cross Movement, which was the fascist uh, party and the uh, party of thugs, basically, towards the end of World War II, only occupies two rooms in the museum, and the rest is dedicated to the um, communist memory. Now, I would like to, there are a lot of things we can talk about here. I would like to emphasize three main points. The first is pretty much what I already mentioned, that the museum treats the whole communist period as one interrupted totalitarian uh, time period. It doesn't distinguish between the Stalinist period, the post-1956 reprisals, and the more mild Guyash communist time of Janos uh, Kada's dictatorship since 1963. And in fact, this is, on the one hand, this reflects the politics of memory of this Fidesz government. On the other hand, you can see that it does not give any special room to the victims of Stalinism in the memory of the nation. The selection of the victims is also very interesting and very telling because the focus is on the plight of the clergy, the peasantry, and the anti-communist right. And if you look at the immediate post-Stalinist period, which focused on the, on the show trial victims of communism, on the communist victims of communism, here you can see the opposite. No left-wing, not even social democratic victims are mentioned, not to mention the show trial victims. It's uh, those who belong to the right, but at the same time, it is a very wide net. So if you were not, if people were not uh, committed to communism, actively participating in the regime, they can associate themselves with victims who have a special wall and a special remembrance room, wall of, uh, room of tears called, and in that respect, it's a very uh, stark distinction between perpetrators who have a separate wall and victims, and in a way, it describes Hungary as a nation, a victimized nation, oppressed by a foreign country, the Soviet Union, and forced under the dictatorship with the collaboration of a few people who can be 
named can be found and the rest of the nation can regard itself as victims. And finally, there is also a part of the museum which dedicates uh, some room to the so-called anti-communist resistance, saying that the anti-communist resistance was successful, that's why the country is today free. However, um, since it's the pre-56 so-called anti-communist resistance, it's uh, not particularly truthful because there wasn't much of that kind of anti-communist resistance. There were people who came together and said how a new government could be much better than the actual one they had. However, until 56, there was no active anti-communist resistance. And to assume that there was one somewhat distorts the, the story of the communist period, the Stalinist period, while at the same time, um, there is no real room dedicated to the anti-fascist uh, fight whose members were mainly communist and not very numerous either. And at the same time, um, it's also telling that some former fascists can also be uh, discovered on the wall of victims as, as victims of communism. And the other thing which was very important about this museum is the idea that it treats uh, the Nazi symbol, the swastika, or the aerocross symbol together with the red star, and in a way that shows that it equates the two dictatorships which I referred to before, that certain legislation was trying to do that, and this kind of equally evil um, argument pretty much um, ruled the, the last, let's say, four years of the Hungarian, um, Hungarian politics because the Fidesz government, which came to power again in 1910, passed a few pieces of legislation which uh, support this argument. I would like to mention, basically, I think, uh, three important pieces. The first is that uh, the parliament in 1910 made the denial of communist crimes a crime. And before that, the, the socialist parliament made the denial of Nazi crimes, the Holocaust denial, a crime. Now, the Fidesz government put the denial of communist crimes next to it, really equating the two two regimes and the two groups of crimes. The second important thing is that uh, the new constitution, or as they call it, fundamental law, claims that the country lost its self, um, self determination in 1944 when Germany occupied Hungary and only regained it in 1990. Therefore, again, at a constitutional level, it is elevated, on the one hand, the conflation of Nazism and communism, and at the same time, again, we can see this uh, plight of an innocent nation of Hungary, which is not really responsible for anything, because it's always been the bad occupiers who uh, forced it to do certain things they didn't want to do. And the fourth, uh, the third thing I would like to mention, that if you remember the law which has been thrown out by the Constitutional Court, because the Constitutional Court opposed to the lifting of the statute of limitation retrospectively. Now the idea that, um, that crimes are prosecuted for political reasons and committed in the name of the name or in the interest of the party state cannot have statute of limitation. So in fact, the lifting or throwing out of the statute of limitation is now at a constitutional level enshrined in the constitution. So there is no constitutional court which can do anything with it. So in fact, you might say that the the road to prosecute 
Stalinist crimes is open. However, uh, nothing have, has been done in this respect so far. The only thing which uh, happened is the prosecution of this formerly mentioned uh, very old man, 90-something, uh, Bela Biscu, who was the chairman of uh, investigating Stalinist crimes after 56, in 1962 actually. Now he was prosecuted and uh, sentenced, convicted and sentenced for the denial of communist crimes, which on the one hand shows how this uh, uh, new law has been put into effect. On the other hand, it also shows that it dodges any kind of real issue about Stalinist crimes, using only the denial as a, as a, as a possible ground for prosecution. So I think um, that's, what, that's how much I wanted to say, and thank you. Thank you very much. Our uh, last but not least speaker is uh, Dr. Theon Zingo from uh, University of, Sar uh, of uh, <laughs> the Institute of National uh, History of Macedonia. Uh, he works at the Balkan Department of the Institute of National History uh, of this university in the Republic of Macedonia. He wrote his PhD uh, about the Balkan states in the policy of Great Britain in the interwar period. He was also a visiting professor at the University of uh, Leipzig and has published a really impressive number of uh, articles and uh, several books. Um, and today he will mm, uh, talk about uh, mysterious, the title of his paper is uh, Golan, Goli Otok, the Island of Death. So the floor is yours. Dear Patrick, uh, at the very beginning, let me express my gratitude for composing or arranging such accurate and well-organized conference. Uh, I would like to thank you about the opportunity to be a part of this conference and to visit the country where my mother was born. So I would like to tell you that uh, to you and your colleagues that from now on you have a dedicated friend and a colleague that is at your disposal. Thank you. Uh, the liberation of Europe after the Second World War had two dimensions. For the Western European states, 1945 was the turning point towards the democracy and liberalism, while for the Eastern European states, as well as the Balkan states that belonged to the Soviet sphere of interest, 1945 was a year in which one dictatorship was replaced with another. Yugoslavia, as in the whole period between the end of the Second World War and its destruction in 1991, represented a mixture of the Western democracy and Eastern dictatorship, a medallion with two sides, which was consisted of a bright, shining side represented by pro-Western ideas and a dark, non-visible side filled with terror, unhuman measures, and hunt for the so-called enemies of the state within its borders. The first two years after the liberation and declaring of the second or Tito's Yugoslavia, were spent for settling of the accounts with the collaborators of the occupiers. Accusations were widespread across the state. The enemies of the people were captured and sentenced to prison and death penalties. But the task of the new liberator, liberators okay, was not fulfilled, so they decided to continue their witch hunt towards the members of the society that had different opinion and ideas for creating the post-war society within the state borders. The creation of the Communist Information Bureau, or shortly named Inform Bureau, in 1947, traced the path in the clash against the state enemies. Opposing the Stalin's demands for subordination in the hierarchical pyramid of the communist world, the Yugoslav communists decided to fight against his supporters or people that were convinced that the perfect image of the new communist sphere is rather different than the ideas that were forced by the Belgrade authorities in the first place and afterwards by their followers in the capital cities on local level. The clash between Tito and Yugoslav leaders on one side and Stalin and Soviet Union on the other side was the strongest imbalance in the period between declaring of Democratic Federative Yugoslavia and its destruction. 
in the, e f the fear of the forthcoming attack by the Soviet Union and its satellites in the pictures of Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania launched a new type of war, minor everyday battles against the internal enemies. And the so-called enemies were in the each segment of the society, in the army squads, among the police officers, in the universities, as well as among the ordinary people. The Yugoslav authorities decided to create their own unique type of prison camps systematized in three different locations. Stara Gradishka, in which they placed mainly the members of the army squads, Bileča, and the most known and biggest by the number of prisoners, Goli Otok, in the Adi Adriatic Sea. The prison Goli Otok, created for the male prisoners, was a stone island on a 10 kilometer distance from the coast, surrounded by water. The female prisoners were taken to the island of St. Gregor. The most important segment of Goli Otok's location was the distance of more than hundreds of kilometers between the prison and the Yugoslav borders with Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. Jo Kapicic, the first minister of interior of Montenegrin government after the Second World War and deputy of Alexander Rankovic, the federal minister of interior of Yugoslavia, speaking about the main goal of the prison and the main fear of the internal enemies, stresses. I'm quoting, we, never, we were never sure who could follow them, how many people they are going to recruit, how far they are prepared to go. They betrayed Tito and the party. It is correct, they were fighting along us during the war. We knew who they were, what they are capable of, and maybe because of the fact that we knew who we are dealing with, Somehow, we were scared of that. End of the quotation. Goli Otok and the year of 1949 were used by the Yugoslav propaganda and historiography as the crucial point of Tito's refusal to the Stalin's idea for creating Yugoslavia as another Soviet satellite. It was the one and only path of the Yugoslav communists. But behind the curtain, Goli Otok was the extermination camp of the ideas for world revolution, destruction of the beliefs for liberty and possibilities for free will and changes within the frames of Yugoslavia and the Communist Party. Goli Otok erased large numbers of dedicated patriots, people who were internationalists, soldiers who fought in the Spanish Civil War and afterwards actively participated in the Second World War. The most responsible persons for the invention or creating of Goli Otok are Stevo Krajacic, the chief of the Croatian State Security Police called UDBA, and Edvard Kardel, one of the most prominent Yugoslav communistic leaders. In the period between 1948 and 1963 in Yugoslavia, this resolution of the Inform Bureau was supported by 55,000 persons, or separately, defined by their role in the society, the people were divided into several groups. More than 5,000 workers, 5,626 farmers, more than 4,000 students, 21,880 participants in the Second World War, more than 4,000 members of the army squads, 2.5 thousand people, persons of high positions in the party nomenclature, 1,700 members of the police units, and 1,189 functionaries and members of the municipalities. More than 60,000 of them were sent to prison or the so-called social useful work, but the numbers separated according to the republics in Yugoslavia were not equal. Most of them were Serbs composing 44%, then Montenegrins 21%, Croats 15%, Macedonians 5%, Slovenians 3%, Albanians 2%, Bulgarians 1.5% and Hungarians 1.5%. It is clear that the majority was composed by the Serbs and Montenegrins, mainly because of the historical heritage and common ideals between Serbia, Montenegro, and Russia in the past. However, the most numerous arrests happened in the period between 1949 and 1951. Officially, Goli Otok was never named as a prison camp. It was named Labor Camp Mermer, or Marvel in English. According to the documents, the prisoners were not sent on a prison sentence. They were sent on social useful work. 
The trials were unique just for the members of the army, while the other enemies of the state were never, take, were never taken to court. The civilians were taken to Goliotok as administrative measures rendered by local administrative officials. The administrative measure was never documented as sentence. After its passing, the prisoner was directly taken to Goliotok. Auschwitz had its own sign at the entrance saying that Arbeit macht frei, while Goliotok had a unique sign saying, I'm quoting, the care of the party for our health, bright example of humanity, end of the quotation. The cynicism of the prison and party authorities had various dimensions. When the prisoners were arriving on the island, taken there with the transport ship Punat, they were forced to run through the so-called Spaler, or hot rabbit, a row of prisoners that were already there who were supposed to welcome the new arrivers, hitting them with fists and kicks, as cruel as they could, because if the authorities doubted the willingness of the prisoners to participate in that welcoming ceremony, they were forced to run together with the new arrivers. Each new prisoner received soap for per personal hygiene, but there was no water for washing and cleaning. The inmates were named as gang, state enemies, and traitors. The state and prison authorities were using the worst measures to put pressure over the inmates to change their attitude and opinion regarding the clash between Tito and Stalin. The prisoners were forced on hard physical work, such as crushing stones, building the prison barracks, combined with systematic propaganda, in which they were forced to shout slogans glorifying Josip Broz Tito and the Yugoslav decision for a unique future, separate from the communistic world. Each night, gathered in the prison barracks, the prisoners had the opportunity to discuss on political manners, mainly regarding the relations between Yugoslavia and the other communist states. They had the opportunity to change their opinion and sign a statement in which they admitted their sins and were prepared to integrate in the society. They were called revidirci, or people that have changed their attitude. Right after the signing of the petition, their prison life was changed in a better way. All the others that refused to sign it were put on a so-called boycott, ignored and beaten by the prison guards and the other prisoners, allocated to do the hardest work in the camp. The state quite often offered to the spouses of the prisoners a state divorce, a way of divorce in which the family was separated from the sinners and their opinion by the state. Even after their release, the prisoners couldn't integrate in the society because they have lost their civil rights, were rejected by the vicinity, and even the members of their families were reputed as enemies of the state. The worst part of the prison was reserved for the worst prisoners. Those who refused to obey in front of the Yugoslav communist leaders. It was named Petrova Rupa or Petros Hall, according to the prisoner Petar Komnenich, who was president of the Montenegrin parliament before he was dispatched to Goliotok. It was a prison within the prison, a hole seven meters deep, 20 meters wide, created for those people who were seen as threat for the other prisoners. But not because of their cruelty or desire for revenge, but because of their readiness to confront to every humiliation and inflicting pain and to show their firm political and human will. Around that part was built three meters high wall with watchtowers. In Petrova Rupa or Petros Hall were placed approximately 130 prisoners, mainly former ministers, soldiers of the Spanish Civil War, members of the central committees of the Communist Party, university professors, ambassadors, and army generals. The prison Goliotok was used for human torture until 1955 when Josip Broz Tito and Nikita Khrushchev met in Belgrade and improved the relations between the two states. The prison Goliotok remained open until 1986, but it was used for imprisoning criminals and transgressors. 
in the 1970s and 1980s, the communist propaganda in Yugoslavia was filled with statements that the main actors in the Yugoslav communist hierarchy were not familiar with the existence and the conditions of the Goli Otak prison camp. But that is absolutely incorrect. For example, Alexander Rankovic, the chief of Yugoslavian state security police, visited Goli Otok several times, as well as Jovo Kapicic, the first Montenegrin Minister of Interior, previously mentioned. In an interview with a Serbian journalist, Kapicic was denying the terror that was happening on Goli Otok. I'm quoting, from our side, nobody was killed there. Nobody was placed in front of a firing squad, terrorized or tormented, end of the quotation. But the facts are not on his side. Thanks to the dedicated and accurate work of the employees of the Croatian State Archive, we have in front of us the lists of the people that were sent to Goli Otok, as well as precise lists of those who lost their lives in the prison. I brought those lists with me and I'm going to leave them to our hosts for their respected archive. According to those information, more than 400 people lost their lives while they were serving their punishment in the Adriatic Sea. Some of them were killed during their escape attempts, some of them were beaten to death or they took their own lives, some of them were drowned or were killed in an accident during the work on the quarry or died because of hunger or exhaustion. According to those lists, in Goli Otak were sent approximately 16,000 prisoners, but so far, more than 35 people are missing in this evidence. Quite often, historians and politicians are making efforts to minimize or maximize the number of the prisoners. Their number varies between 16,000 and 31,000. From this time distance, the commitments for reduction of the numbers appears very strange. Even one political prisoner subjected to cruelty and terror is sufficient. 16,000 represents striking cognition. It is obvious that Josip Broz Tito and his followers did not succeed in their intention to create unique, united moral field in which they wanted to include all the members of the Yugoslav society. Sabrina Ramet notes, I'm quoting, the morality shaped and manipulated by the policy, culture and religion, at the end was lying in the heart of the destruction of the Yugoslav system in Yugoslavia, end of the quotation. A government could not be legitimate in a country where self-destructure values were demanded by the system. The prisoners were using stones for crushing stones. So the main goal of the authorities was to use the stone for crushing a stone and use of the soul to crush another soul. From this time distance, 70 years afterwards, the silence and the fear of the survived inmates in their conversations with me and my colleagues, unfortunately, is the best evidence for their partial success. The conspiracy of silence is still present among the survivors. I'm going to conclude with a quotation by Vera Winter, a lady from Zagreb, who was prisoner in Goli Otok, or more precisely, in the female camp on St. Gregor between 1949 and 1952. And quoting, those who were beating stronger were faster sent out from the prison. Those who resisted stayed longer, but we were all beaten and we beat the others. We were all being lowered on the level of the executor. We have all made a compromise with our own consciousness. Therefore, it is extremely hard to talk about it, and that is the main reason why we are, years after, still ashamed. And after the release, we are still afraid. End of the quotation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Theon. Thank you to all the, uh, the participants of this panel. I'm opening discussion. Uh, we have just uh, quite an uh, impressive, comparative uh, attitude. Uh, tak więc zachęcam do zadawania uh, pytań, czy do krótkich w miarę możliwości komentarzy. Mamy jeszcze czas, tro uh, mamy trochę czasu na dyskusję, tak więc jeżeli ktoś uh, byłby skłonny zabrać głos, to, uh, to zapraszam. Profesor Jerzy Eisler. Ja mam pytanie do kolegi z Białorusi. Czy ja dobrze zrozumiałem, że wedle pańskich szacunków, dla mnie to jest bardzo ciekawa liczba, bo ja 
długo jej szukałem. W Armii Polskiej w 1939 roku po mobilizacji żołnierze Białorusini to 7, około 70 tysięcy. Około, tak, tak, tak. A czy dysponuje pan liczbą ewentualnie, jaka część z nich, czy liczba, czy procentowo zginęła w czasie działań wojennych w 1939 roku, bo to jest bardzo interesujące, my ciągle podajemy, no bo oczywiście z punktu widzenia prawa międzynarodowego nie wszyscy byli polskimi żołnierzami, no ale jednak ten czynnik narodowy jest tutaj również y, wydaje się ważny. I pytanie, czy raczej wątpliwości, być może ja nie zrozumiałem y, dokładnie, ale zastanawiałem się, czy, to był, czy pani referowała czyjeś poglądy, czy to był pani pogląd, że zrównanie faszyzmu, nazizmu z komunizmem, krótko mówiąc swastyki z sierpem i młotem, czy z gwiazdą, jest czymś niedopuszczalnym. Bo jeśli by tak było, byłby to pierwszy przypadek w moim życiu osoby z Europy Środkowo-Wschodniej, która tak uważa. Cała masa, nawet niestety kolegów historyków, politologów na Zachodzie jest w tym momencie oburzona, że nie wolno porównywać, bo przecież to było jedno było dobre, szlachetne, czyli komunizm, a drugie było po prostu zbrodnicze, nazizm, faszyzm. Natomiast przyznam się szczerze, że po naszej części, w naszej części kontynentu nie udało mi się takiego poglądu nigdy usłyszeć. Rozumiem, że pani referowała w dużym stopniu poglądy polityków węgierskich. Ja powiem szczerze, zastanawiałem się, to było oczywiście bardzo ciekawe, sporo się dowiedziałem, natomiast czy, Mam takie generalne pytanie, wątpliwość, czy my historycy, i nie mówię tego z pozycji wyższości ex katedra, ale tak czysto racjonalnie, rzeczywiście powinniśmy zajmować się współczesnymi nam politykami, którzy gmerają, kręcą, kombinują przy historii, cały czas pracują śrubokrętem, tu odkręcą, tam dokręcą i wydaje im się, że że tak będzie, jak, jak im się wydaje, przed najbliższą kampanią wyborczą. To oczywiście nie dotyczy tylko Węgier, bo ja w tym momencie mówiłem o Polsce i to jest dokładnie ta, ta, ten sam problem. Też nie zrozumiałem, czy pani należy do osób, które um, uważają dom terroru, Muzeum Terroru w Budapeszcie, za wielkie nieszczęście. E, tak się składa, że miałem okazję oglądać, e, zwiedzać ten e, budynek. I pani referowała, to już ewidentnie były czyjeś poglądy któregoś z polityków, czy tak sądzę lewicowych, że jest tak niewiele o strzałokrzyżowcach, o Ferenczu Szalasim i jego no faszystach, to po prostu byli węgierscy faszyści i ich zbrodniach, a tak dużo o zbrodniach komunistycznych. No, można by na to odpowiedzieć taki, w taki aptekarski sposób. Szalas i jej spółka rządzili Węgrami przez rok i to mają nad so, mając nad sobą yy, Berlin. Yy, Rakosz i Kadar i spółka rządzili Węgrami przez 44 czy 45 lat, no też mając nad sobą, no tylko że nie Berlin, a Moskwę. Więc jeśli takich porównań się trzymać, to te dwie sale o strzałokrzyżowcach są jak najbardziej proporcjonalnie mieszczą się. Natomiast to, co dla mnie w tym muzeum jest najbardziej wstrząsające, poza samym czołgiem, który jest no, jakby powiedzieć, atrakcją dla dzieci, ponieważ jak można do budynku wstawić prawdziwy czołg? No można. Technicznie jest to możliwe, zrobiono to. Jest to, ta sala nazwana szatnią, przebieralnią, gdzie na jednym biegunie mamy mundur właśnie strzałokrzyżowca, a na drugim końcu tej samej sali mundur awosza, czyli komunistycznego bezpieczniaka. Czyli taka po prostu przebieralnia. Przychodzili faszyści, 
Sołokrzyżowcy i część z nich zasilała kadry komunistycznego aparatu bezpieczeństwa. I tym bardziej mnie się wydaje, ja jestem przekonany, mi się nie wydaje, że zrównanie, znak równania między sierpem i młotem, czy gwiazdą, a swastyką jest jak najbardziej na miejscu i jestem gotów o tym bardzo długo merytorycznie dyskutować. Bardzo dziękuję. Bardzo dziękuję. Proszę bardzo, pan Łukasz Stach. Ja mam pytanie do pana doktora Teona Dzingo. Czy ktoś poniósł odpowiedzialność za to, co działo się na tej wyspie, o której pan mówił? Dziękuję. Proszę bardzo, profesor Hegdycz. Question for uh, Dr. Jingo. I noticed among the nationalities you mentioned, there were no Bosniaks sent there. And if so, where were they sent, if they were sent anywhere? And uh, for Dr. Amenikow, uh, were there any Belarusian uh, Polish military officers among those killed at Katyn? Thank you. To może te, a jeszcze, jeszcze pani i wtedy damy głos y, prelegentom. Barbara Padło i mam pytanie do y, kolegi z Białorusi, czy y, żołnierze y, białoruscy służący w, wojsku, pols, polsku, y, w polskim wojsku mają świadomość tego, że mogą starać się o przyznanie im uprawnień kombatanckich, polskich uprawnień kombatanckich tutaj przez Urząd do Spraw Kombatanckich, czy w ogóle wiedzą o, o, o przysługujących im prawach? Teraz udzielimy głosu y, naszym prelegentom. Y, so maybe we will start with you, Tsilakis, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a lot of questions. Not sure I will cover everything in detail. Um, first of all, what, what should historians do or not do? Uh, primarily in this respect, I am a political scientist and what I am interested in is the politics of memory. So for me it is important what kind of, how history comes across in the actual politics of memory and uh, how different political actors, governments, oppositions, other political parties, actors reflect on it and how it plays out in politics. Now, I would think, I would suggest that uh, it is a debated issue whether or not equating Nazism and communism is uh, a good idea. In Western Europe, you would, f you would find a lot of people who find the equation unacceptable. I have my opinion about it, which is uh, more or less in sync with the uh, with what the late Tony Jott uh, expressed at one point, that there is some difference between something whose uh, purpose is pure evil and between whose purpose is something better. And then you can discuss, is it better, is it worse if something with good intentions goes bad or is it better? But uh, in this talk, I was mainly trying to recap the main arguments addressing the House of Terror Museum and this, the equation, on the one hand, was a welcome sign by certain political groups and on the other hand was criticized by other political groups. For me, interested in the politics of memory, that was the important issue. And the last thing I would like to um, touch on is the length of the uh, dictatorships you are mentioning. Now, since the House of Terror based its location and exhibition on the history of this Andrashi Street 60 building, you might make the argument that the length of time the Aerocross movement spent there on the one hand and the Avo Aveha that is the state security spent there on the other was approximately equal because after 56 there was no AVH in Andrashi Street 60 and therefore we could make the argument that everything after 56 doesn't belong 
to that building. And if you take it like that, then again, it's a question of interest taste, but this again was an issue in the debate surrounding the museum, whether or not the two systems should have received attention based on time or based on some other issues. Um, there were some other questions debated in the museum I didn't get into, but uh, we can talk about it if you wish. Thank you. Uh, bardzo dziękuję za pytania. Ja będę po polsku odpowiadał, no i na pytanie po angielsku to też po angielsku będzie, uh, więc uh, dziękuję za pytanie o liczbie Białorusinów uh, zginęłych. Uh, no to ciężkie pytanie. Uh, niestety w historiografii polskiej nie przeprowadzono jakichś tam badań głębokich uh, o historii Białorusinów. Uh, znaczy ja, są książki, ale żeby tak uh, szczegółowo podliczyć, więc możemy mówić o uh, bitwach, o udziale w jakichś bitwach i znów nie ma takich dokładnych liczb, na przykład obrona Kobrynia. Mamy dane o tym, że brało udział bardzo dużo miejscowych, że w składzie 183 Pułku Piechoty, który stworzony, został stworzony na bazie e, pułku tego 83 z Kobrynia e, imienia, imienia Trauguta, e, że tam brali udział e, miejscowi e, żołnierze, żołnierze z tych terenów kobryńskich, więc jak ja pokazywałem, śmiertelniki są na tym polu, zostali znalezione i oni są i tam napisany jest prawosławny, miejscowy, znaczy pochodzi z tego terenu i to, co mi na przykład mi udaje się znaleźć, to, to takie jedyncze, pojedyncze rzeczy, które ja później grupuję i zbieram, dla Polaków to jest żołnierz czy oficer Wojska Polskiego. Na przykład e, znalazłem grup e, nieznanego bohatera Białorusina, oficera, podporucznika Wiktora Emilianiuka, który brał udział w obronie Brześcia i został zabity podczas obrony e, Toma, Tomaszowa Lubelskiego. Tam na dane Lubelszczyzny oni cofali się i rodzina, która teraz mieszka w Mińsku, do 2011 roku nie posiadała wiedzy o tym, że ten człowiek został pochowany i że corocznie na tym grobie leżą świeże kwiaty i że Polacy po prostu podchodzą, przychodzą, że w centrum miasta jest ten grób i że wszystko jest dobrze. I napisany jest bohater, który zaginął w trakcie kampanii wrześniowej, bohater, który walczył o Polskę. To, że ten człowiek był prawosławnym, białorusinem, z całości z rodziny prawosławnej, że obchodzili święte i tak dalej, nikt o tym nie mówił do ostatniego momentu. I ja znalazłem to miejsce i ludzie pojechali tam, zobaczyli. Na, na mogile, na, na grobie na tym nie było napisane niestety nic, no ale dla administracji tego Tomaszowa Lubelskiego też była po prostu taką ciekawostką, że tutaj leży Białorusin, oficer Białorusin. A tutaj mam też konotację z następną e, pytaniem o tych Białorusinach w Katyniu. Na przykład <grywka> córka tego Wiktora Milianiuka mówi, że ponieważ był Białorusiną, to jakby trafił do niewoli, a całość jego pułku trafiła do niewoli i później o, została zabita w o, Ostaszkowie, to on by też został się w tym, znaczy znalazł się w tym grobie właśnie w tych grobach katyńskich, bo był e, patriotą, Świadomość miał białoruską, na pewno miał, bo były piosenki białoruskie, była rozmowa po białorusku, znał język białoruski, ale był patriotem tej drugiej Rzeczypospolitej. Co prawda większość tych Białorusinów poszła walczyć raczej nie za Białoruś i raczej nie za Polskę. Oni poszli walczyć za ten swój dom, dom i przeciwko Hitlerowi, którego liczyli właśnie jednym z takich poważnych niebezpieczeństw dla całej Europy. Narodowa świadomość tych Poleszuków była za niska, aby mówić, że to byli po prostu no, Poleszucy, tak, bo w historiografii to przyjęto i ja to lubię używać w cudzysłowie Poleszucy. Um, ona była taka, że po prostu jesteśmy dumni z tego, że będziemy walczyć przeciwko wrogom, przeciwko Niemcom, nazistom. Sporo z nich było uczestnikami wojny, pierwszej wojny światowej. 
И, но попросту вальчили и вальчили думни. И в реляциях немцев, в реляциях поляков написано, что очень файно вальчили. Więc w obronie twierdzę Brzeski też procent miejscowych był bardzo duży, dlatego że tam rezerwowy były półki, brali udział w obronie twierdzy Brzeskiej. Z tego powodu też znaczna liczba tych ludzi, które właśnie z pochodzenia byli miejscowego, też Poliszucy, też tam byli Ukraińcy, Białorusini. I tutaj jest ten problem niestety no, podkreślenia, oznaczenia tego wszystkiego. Ale Liczymy, zbieramy tą informację i informacja ta się zbiera dlatego, że to potrzebna rzecz i jak się zbiera, po prostu ludzie zwracają się do mnie, zrzucają swoje archiwa prywatne, domowe, z, które mają i mają, posiadają informację, że brali udział w kampanii wrześniowej tej Białorusini i co dalej po prostu nie, nie wiedzą. I po prostu ja albo zwracam się do jakichś e, polskich instytucji, do CAWO, do karty, do innych, albo zbieram informacje prywatnie, co mogło być dalej, gdzie oni przynajmniej brali udział, w jakiej, w jakiej, w jakiej części tej kampanii wrześniowej. A, I ta informacja się zbiera powolutku, pomalutku. No, nie mogę mówić o tysiącach, ale przynajmniej setki już są i można to po prostu dalej rozwijać. Uh, as for the question of uh, Katyn uh, crimes, I would like to say about uh, the Belarusian Katyn list. Um, it's very difficult and very uh, important question of our Belarusian history. So um, uh, as far as you know, uh, the Belarusian archives of Belarusian KGB is closed and the whole information, uh, as far as I, th I understand, the whole information about the Katyn crimes uh, we have to find, uh, we, we, we can find not only in Minsk, but also in Moscow, uh, AFB, uh, uh, FSB archives, the former KGB of uh, Soviet Union. As for Minsk, uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, crime uh, cases there, and we have I have found uh, some people who were um, uh, who were arrested by NKVD, uh, former Polish officers, former soldiers, uh, and who were transferred to Minsk prison. And after that, uh, um, we have no information about uh, these persons. Uh, as for Belarusians, it's very difficult to say about uh, Belarusian people here. Uh, we can say about the people who was born uh, on the territory of Western Belarus or on the territory of uh, Northwestern, uh, Northeastern Borderlands. And um, of course, um, we have to study this question. We have to um, collect the whole information about uh, policemen, about uh, Polish officers uh, who were of, uh, Pol of Belarusian or even Polish origin, who were born on the territory of um, Western Belarus and who, were, who became uh, victims of uh, the Soviet uh, regime. Uh, I also work on, on this uh, uh, question, on this case. Uh, I just try to find um, uh, documents about the people who were arrested by NKVD. But as far as you know, uh, Belarusian authorities uh, uh, told in uh, 2011 uh, that uh, no Poles were killed uh, on the territory of BSR uh, in 1940. And this is a problem. But uh, we are be just working about me and, for example, Igor Kuznetsov, uh, the well-known uh, Belarusian uh, scholar, uh, working about um, this uh, problem of Belarusian cutting list. Wracając do ostatniego pytania, co się tyczy Białorusinów, czy wiedzą te Białorusini, czy oni mogą być bohaterami tej wojny obrony? Niestety większość Można powiedzieć, że 100% tych bohaterów nie doczekało się tego momentu. Umarli, co prawda państwo białoruskie dopiero w 1995 roku przyznało im prawo weteranów Wielkiej Otecznej Wojny, czyli bohaterów, czyli uczestników Wielkiej Wojny Oczyźnianej. Dopiero w 1995 roku dostali pierwszy medal radziecki. 
Те люди, которые мешкали на терене Заходней, чили на терене Советской Беларуси, они а, достали войсковую шанжечку Радецкую, где было записано, что не брали удел в Другой войне Святовой, значит, не брали удел в Великой войне Отчизняной. Другая война Святого, то для радистского системы то было ниц в ОГУЛЕ, а Великая война Отчизня, они фактически не брали удел, więc того выстачало, чтобы так было написано и тыле. Допиро в 1975 году президент Лукашенко дал первый медаль этим людям, медаль 50 лет звичайства в Великой войне Отчизняны. Некоторые люди достали то. Теж доставали ze стороны польской медаль за удел в войне обороны 1939 года. Але варто, варто розуміти, що некоторые люди навет резигнували з того медалю. Я знам особисті кілька осіб білорусінів, які достали інформацію, що там обігає он медаль люди, які в ogóle не мали дочинення до тейго до тей війни, і по просто білорусіні, які служили в військо польським, помислили, що а по це нам ten польський медаль, як ми мами так, як ми брали удел не по мете медалі, тільки вальчили з тим Хітлером. І ну Właśnie ta wystawa, którą robiłem, ta zachodnia białoruska Atlantyda, to musiała no, przeciągnąć uwagę do, tej proble do tego problemu, który istniał i istnieje. I na tą wystawę, na otwarcie tej wystawy przychodzili ludzie, a, którzy przynosili zdjęcia tego dziadka w polskim mundurze i mówili, przepraszamy, proszę, prosimy pana powiedzieć, co to jest w ogóle. My jesteśmy z Mińska cały czas, mieszkamy tam, dlaczego mój dziadek jest w polskim mundurze? Czego on tam, gdzie on tam był, co to było w ogóle za historia. I wytłumaczyć to, że oni brali udział, że oni walczyli z tym nazizmem od pierwszego dnia, to właśnie jest taką poważną kwestią dla historyków współczesnych białoruskich. I to nie tylko na poziomie takim naukowym, bo ja tak jak zawsze mówię, jakąś gazetkę czy tam jakąś, jakiś artykuł naukowy przeczyta 10 osób. A Jeszcze 10 pójdzie do biblioteki i jeszcze przeczyta. A tak żeby społeczeństwo, które w ogóle nie rozumie, co to jest 17 września i co było za tym 17 września. Ja jestem zwolennikiem tego 17 września. Jednak zawsze mówię, dobrze, że zjednoczyliśmy, ale jaką cenę zapłaciliśmy za to? To drugie pytanie na długi czas było bez, bez odpowiedzi. Wystawą tą robiłem nie, nie na 17 września, nie na tą rocznicę, 75. rocznicę tego, tego zjednoczenia, a na 1 września, żeby właśnie była mowa o tych ludzi, którzy brali udział. I zbór tej informacji, on idzie dalej i po prostu, no, mam nadzieję, że no, po prostu jest zainteresowanie, duże zainteresowanie społeczeństwa, więc tak będziemy dalej robić. Dzięki. Profesor, would you like to add something? Thank you. And then Jingo. Uh, I will start first with a question about the Bosnians. Uh, I didn't have intention to offend uh, the Bosnians. I have a lot of friends there and that I admire them, but uh, I, I just want to show you something. Uh, in 1949, uh, the Bosnians were not recognized as separate nationality in Yugoslavia. So mainly they were divided into uh, they mainly they were divided into Croatians, uh, Serbs, and sometimes they were placed in a paragraph under Yugoslavia, Yugoslavs, and, and that's it. That is the main reason. Um, unfortunately, uh, each um, republic of former Yugoslavia had its own archive with these documents. As far as I know, the Bosnian uh, documents are missing. I'm not sure if they were. Uh, destroyed during the war in Bosnia on the, or this uh, flame that happened a couple of years ago in Sarajevo in their national library, but we cannot find them so far. Uh, the second thing about uh, was anybody responsible uh, or accused? Nobody was because Goli Otok officially never existed. It was uh, a company called Mermer the people were going there, working. Uh, it was subject that was not spoken for until late 80s, when some Serbian um, writers started writing novels about what was happening on Goliotok. It was completely prohibited subject on each level in, of the society. Even, for example, uh, I made an interview with a, a, a person that was there, uh, 
And even in 2013, he begged me and I had to give him my word that I'm go not going to publish his testimony three years after his death. So even today, he's, they are terrified and they do not wish to speak. And mainly because of the fact that except the guards, they were hitting or beating between them. So uh, a lot of them are speaking some names, but they are all wishing to forget that. No one, no one was responsible. Thank you once again for all the panelists.